Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, it's real joy to be here, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, welcome to everyone in the room. Also a welcome to the people who uh, are watching the recorded version. I am a, uh, a white woman with um, sort of mid-length uh, brownish grayish hair in my 50s, and I'm wearing a uh, red top with a, um, uh, a dark green uh, overtop. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the labour of disabled people, and I want this to be what I hope will be a kind of um, very open-ended entry point for us to think today about the place that disability might have in some of our wider stories, thinking about welfare state development particularly, but also thinking about the, the, the place that labour has in the lives of disabled people, the kinds of work that they were expected to do, or sometimes required to do, the kind of value that their work had and who benefited from it. This, I hope, uh, gives us ways of thinking about political economy, ways of thinking about moral economy, ways of thinking about um, questions of scale in history. And I, I, I hope that this topic really speaks to Ewan Green's legacy as a historian who was incredibly innovative in how he thought about politics, who was really committed to placing politics in socio-cultural and economic uh, contexts. And I think who would have been really fascinated by the way in which disability politics doesn't necessarily align very closely. There's not a very good fit between it and established party political or ideological traditions. I think he might also have found resonance in the history of labor and disability through his own life experiences of academic labor and also living with chronic illness. So I'd really like to thank his family for their support of this lecture um, and uh, a big thanks to Sean Pooley for making it possible and, and um, for hosting us. Now, as a kind of prelude, it's worth noting that in the, in the kind of most recent four decades when there's been a, a big proliferation of identity categories doing very important and powerful work in thinking about how we do history, particularly those associated with gender, race, class, and sexuality, disability has been a bit of a latecomer. It's got a very low profile and one that's not really reflective of its prevalence within human populations, which is, is normally estimated to be somewhere between 18 and 20 percent. In the UK today, around a fifth of the working age population is disabled and they experience very much substantially higher unemployment rates. So, Disability is a, a very profoundly significant issue. It's, it's there very, very much in, in, in policy debates. Um, but I think it's not there much in our histories. Why might that be? In some ways, it's because disability encapsulates and, and ranges across such a wide range of experiences that it can be really hard to group them all together under a label of disability history. It has stigmatizing qualities. That means that lots of people, lots of the historic, historical actors that I'm going to talk about today, but also um, uh, whole communities, and I'm thinking here of the deaf community, have very deliberately disidentified with, um, with disability. So I'm not going to talk about the experiences of deaf people today who I think you know, can't, can't easily be placed under that label of disability. And nor today am I going to talk about people with experiences of mental illness, or they're, they're, they're not going to be very uh, um, significant in the story I'm telling, partly because people with um, uh, mental health experiences were not included in lots of the measures, including the, the labour quota that I'm going to use as my entry point today. And also, their experiences have often been captured in quite different historiographies, so there's um, a good reason for putting them to one side. Disability is a great opportunity for us to think about theory, something that historians sometimes um, are, are quite reluctant to do. And that's because um, there's been a lot of very productive, both theorizing and um, political activity that's based on theory amongst disabled people, particularly the identification of the socially contextually nature of what it is to be disabled, what disability might mean. And that's commonly termed uh, the social model, which was born of very deep frustration with medicalized and individualized accounts of disability. So the work of scholar activists such as Michael Oliver, Colin Barnes, um, Liz Crow, Tom Shakespeare, Paul Hunt, 
um, these are very significant figures in developing the social model that distinguishes between experiences of impairment that might be rooted in sensory or physical or cognitive qualities and the social barriers that those impairments and differences might give rise to. So that leads us to focus on the material environment, for example, the design of buildings or transport systems, as well as much less material um, uh, elements such as the kind of social norms that might underpin benefit systems or courtship or parenting. All of those things amount to um, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the social organization that excludes and others people who um, have bodily differences. Now that social model itself is not static, it evolves over time and one of, the, one of the contributions that historians can make is to historicize it. There are some really interesting earlier attempts to, to kind of reach for that same insight before the coining of the term social model. There's one that, that I love from the 1930s which is, um, which is termed social orthopedics, which one writer says needs to kind of sit alongside medical orthopedics as a way of understanding the experiences of those that he referred to as crippled. So there's, there's a kind of range of ways of thinking about um, social contexts there. But what we have in the social model, however we, we might define it, is a very dynamic and very critical theorization of how different kinds of embodiment might have different values and might get different kinds of resources assigned to them. And I think that we can take a lot from this in ways that is relevant actually across the board for um, all kinds of subfields of historical writing. It helps us to think about identity in ways that aren't, is not only intersectional, I would say that intersectional thinking is you know, now quite well embedded in, in how we approach identity, but also in ways that are fluid and processual. Disability is a status that can be acquired at any time, it can be lost, it's, it's, it's very fluid, its boundaries are quite fuzzy, people move in and out of it, possibly on a daily basis or, or minute by minute. That model of um, fluidity, I think, helps us see and sort of crystallises and, and, and sits nicely alongside ideas that have proved very powerful and very significant for activists and for historians. Ideas, for example, of gender performance or gender transitivity, ideas of political blackness, and the idea of racialization, not as a, um, as a thing or an identity, but as a process. Those ideas around gender, around um, racialization, are kind of very readily reached for by colleagues and by students, whereas ideas around um, disability are not. So there's this real lack of profile, lack of purchase, if you like, in disability, and, and, the, and the critical theories that, that underpin thinking about disability that we might usefully want to, to think about. So with that little prelude about theory, I want to move us into my, my main focus today, which is on um, a particular moment of intervention in British labour markets. This is the quota that was established for the employment of disabled people, which mandated that 3% of any um, workplace larger than 20 people had to be disabled. And that was born in 1944 with the Disabled Persons Employment Act and it was brought to an end in 1995 with the Disability Discrimination Act. Both acts were brought in under Conservative governments, but neither was particularly strongly rooted in um, party ideologies. They weren't, they, disability wasn't really a party political issue in many ways and was, was rooted, as I'll, I'll show today, in, in some quite different contexts, particularly in European examples and policy making. Um, but also in philanthropic approaches. But what was shared across all of those different kind of contexts was the idea that work was absolutely central to thinking about um, disabled people's lives. Now, like disability, work is a very interesting thing for us to, to think about. It's a very dynamic and socially and culturally variable site of experience. Work is something that grants certain kinds of statuses. It cements certain things like, for example, gender or adulthood or citizenship. And what counts as employment or counts as work and what can be gained from it is a topic where I think feminist scholarship has a lot to tell us, where there's been a very critical examination 
of what uh, it is to be a worker. And work, we could say, is a site where forms of power and forms of inequality often are, um, are, are playing out. So we shouldn't think of work just kind of straightforwardly as a source of welfare. And one of the really interesting and important contributions from uh, disability activists has been to really lean into that idea that paid employment shouldn't be the sole arbiter of the value of citizens and of human beings. But at the same time, the claim to work and the demand to be rewarded for work has been a very important source of self-worth and it is very much there at the heart of um, uh, disability activism. So perhaps it's not surprising that in the uh, 1940s when social policy and the nature of work were all being um, looked at by figures such as uh, William Beveridge, Nye Bevan, Ernest Bevan and others, this was also a moment where the employment of, dis of disabled people was um, being questioned and, and, and rethought. That was rooted not in the very famous 1942 Beveridge Report, which is such a kind of iconic uh, um, entity in British history, but instead in the, the much less well-known 1943 Tomlinson Report on the rehabilitation and resettlement of disabled persons, which, which led to the 1944 Act. The Act set up a kind of range of infrastructure that tried to ensure that veterans who were returning from World War II, but also all other disabled people who were kind of swept up in that veteran uh, policymaking moment, were given a compensated status in labour markets. Now, what did that mean? It meant that there were two whole professions um, or, or two whole sectors that were designated as only for the employment of disabled people. I often ask people to guess what they are and nobody's ever been able to guess uh, correctly so far. That's because they were very tiny sectors. Uh, they, they were um, car park attendants and lift operators. Uh, they were not picked by, by, by chance. They were both um, low skill yet uniformed uh, roles and they were typically um, ones where men uh, took those jobs and, and that's what made them seem appropriate for this, this role of disabled only. In addition, a register was set up that was meant to capture really every, every, um, every disabled person in the country who was capable of working and um, would, um, would sit alongside that requirement of, of companies to um, employ 3% of their workforce as disabled people. A system of welfare officers called Disablement Resettlement Officers, or DROs, was set up to work with employers to help them meet the quota. And they offered advice to disabled people um, and directed them either into jobs or rehabilitation. And finally, a um, publicly owned corporation called Remploy was set up. And th the slide here shows um, a man sitting at a bench working on a sort of industrial assembly task with, um, with with crutches propped up against the, the bench, um, uh, who was employed by Remploy. And that was intended to be the place where more severely disabled people might find um, employment. It's a kind of sheltered workshop um, running parallel uh, as an economy, parallel to open labour markets. So this was a moment where um, there was a lot of optimism about what could be done by these interventions not just because of the um, World War II context, which was optimistic about these returning service people who, even if they were disabled, would be given sort of honoured places in the British labour market. There was also a sense of um, the power of rehabilitation, which was imagined through physio or occupational therapy to um, make many more disabled people employable than had been true of the past. And the slide shows a, a magazine feature which has a kind of whole selection of photos of people. Um, uh, they're all um, white male workers um, being sort of given training and assessment and being encouraged into um, paid employment. Um, the, the, the pictures there and the policies really speak to a, a kind of technocratic modernist moment, if you like, um, that was premised on the idea that human ingenuity would kind of fix this problem, that could resolve all physical and mental obstacles and eliminate disability 
or if not eliminate it, ingeniously make it possible for workers with certain kinds of impairments to find a, a, a kind of fitting place in um, uh, paid employment. I, I think that this kind of technocratic faith is a very interesting one. And I, I would even go so far as to say that it's a kind of fantasy. It's a, it's a powerful idea that is there um, across much of the 20th century, the, the hope of finding this kind of fit between bodies and labor in a kind of Fordist sense, but also a fantasy that might be sometimes about the idea of cure or even erasure, which has sort of darker implications, if you like, around the value of disabled people, the idea that they could somehow be sort of technically managed away. This was partly a product of the voracious labor needs of World War, World War II, which had brought lots of people who previously had been deemed unemployable into the economy particularly the, the kind of broad range of people who had been segregated often into um, institutions that were referred to uh, as mental deficiency institutions or subnormality um, hospitals and asylums. So there was a revaluation of the place of a wider range of people and the place that they could find, as well as a, a very powerful language of, of, of productivity and anti-waste, which really shaped these ideas about the labour market. So we could term this the 1944 disability settlement, and we could see it as a kind of social democratic moment uh, of using public ownership and forms of compulsion on the private sector to shape output and employment. It, it definitely can be seen in that kind of light. It's not a very well known part of the welfare reforms, but um, it, 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 it fits as a narrative of, uh, in a narrative of addressing social exclusion, addressing poverty with this proactive state measure. And that's the reading, for example, in, uh, that Julie Anderson gives in her work on rehabilitation and World War II. Although she also puts the provisions of the 1944 Act into a longer historical story by acknowledging that they weren't necessarily as novel as they claimed to be. That's true of quite a, a, a lot of the mid-century welfare measures. They were sort of rebranded by Beveridge as being new, but in fact, they were a kind of rehash of earlier measures. In this case, um, a lot of the 1944 Act was premised on earlier voluntary sector initiatives, such as the founding of the King's Roll Scheme, which um, is depicted here on the slide with two pictures. One is a, a kind of invitation to Bolton employers to employ disabled people. And the other one is a, a certificate that was awarded to employers who did employ uh, disabled men, um, suggesting that they were, they were sort of part of a, a national role of honor. This voluntary um, scheme, like the 1944 quota, actually named a, a level it named 5% as the appropriate level at which um, uh, disabled workers should be employed. Um, it was therefore a little bit more ambitious than the 1944 Act, which only suggested 3%. Um, but because it was non-statutory, it kind of lost momentum quite quickly in the recessionary 1920s, and it didn't do very much for more severely disabled workers. If we kind of deliberately turn our gaze away from the, what we could call the kind of the veteran dominated narrative of um, employment policy, the 1944 Act was also uh, modeled on another um, intervention, which was the 1920 Blind Persons Act, which had supported um, sheltered workshops as a source of employment for blind people. And on the slide here, there's two pictures uh, showing different kinds of publicity for products that were, uh, were made in, in the blind workshops. One is for um, cigarette rolling and the other one is for sort of string or rope work, making, making hammocks and bags. So this was very much the context that, that fed into the founding of Remploy, this idea of the sheltered um, uh, workshop, which had been um, sponsored by the voluntary sector going right back to the mid 19th century and had, had become partially state supported in 1920. And in fact, in some ways, the 1944 Act marginalized the King's role um, perspective, which was that disabled people could be employed across all um, uh, workplaces and revalidated older ideas of segregation, the idea that disabled people were best placed in sheltered 
workshops. The 44 Act was also prompted uh, by um, initiatives and measures that had, had um, uh, been, been undertaken overseas. And there's a very interesting moment in 1933 where the British Department of Overseas Trade asked across um, uh, Europe and the British colonies and dominions what they had been doing around the employment of disabled people. And this was reported back to the British government um, and revealed that France had a, a, a mandated quota of 10% of disabled um, uh, workers, which they had set up in 1924. Fascist Italy had a variety of sort of rehabilitation and insurance provision for th those that they called industrial cripples. Uh, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand and Canada also reported on what they were doing. So this wasn't just a kind of linear narrative of what was happening in Britain. It very much was a global uh, marketplace of social policy ideas that made the 1944 settlement possible. Social democracy was definitely not the only inspiration and it's sort of you know, uncomfortable but, but interesting to think about um, the, the strands of, of fascist policy making that might have fed into this. Moreover, lots of the existing measures, such as those that were set up in 1920 for blind and visually impaired people, actually continued to run alongside the 1944 Act. So you get this like fiendishly complex policy landscape where there's a whole range of different initiatives that all coexist, suturing together the statutory and the voluntary in a mixed economy. Visually impaired individuals continue to be the responsibility of local authorities. Those with intellectual disabilities were under the, the, the oversight of a kind of a much more custodial so-called mental deficiency system. Those who were um, uh, gained an impairment through um, industrial or military service had a different status from those who might have been uh, born with impairments or who were, were injured in other contexts. That was very complex to administer and navigate at the time. I will say it's also very complex for us to understand as historians. It's, it's, it's a, a very messy field. So within the very complex archives that are born of these, these initiatives, I want today to talk about a methodology of how we might do uh, disability history, which is motivated by my own experiences and my, my observations of what we might say are the preferred readings that are embedded in some of these, um, these archives. And this is what I've tried to signal in my title, um, perhaps in a cliched way, but um, the title I gave was Dueling in the Archive. And dueling is my attempt to get at a, two things. Firstly, um, our need to really very proactively um, work against the influence of ideas of disabled people as passive or as tragic victims, as difficult or demanding workers, as cunning scroungers whose, whose claims needed to be policed. Those are the kinds of logics of the archive, if you like. And historians have um, sometimes, I would say, insufficiently um, identified those kind of ableist um, stereotypes. Sometimes they've also produced histories on disability that are simply very abstract, that are all about bureaucratic or institutional systems, but that kind of erase the actual disabled people who were um, enrolled into those, those institutions in a kind of what we could say is a violence of abstraction. Whatever your positionality, it really requires a very constant effort not to be drawn into ableist archives of charities, of businesses, of uh, Whitehall departments, of local councils, of the way the press operates. The hostility that's embedded and the stigmatization that's embedded in lots of these archives, and you, you'll see it all over the sources that I'm going to show you today, is particularly painful because they are almost always premised on a paternalistic idea that they are trying to help disabled people. And um, it does really feel as though that requires a fight to push back against. This, of course, isn't unique to historians of disability, and it's been really useful for me to think about the kind of approaches that have been developed in um, feminist um, historiography and also in post-colonial historiography in, in thinking about the violences and the exclusions of the archive. But I want to suggest today that we might take some very proactive ways of, um, of countering the ableism there. In um, 
a kind of uh, play on the, the homophone of the idea of the dual, which is the dual as in a, a doubled perspective. So in my research um, on disability, I've chosen to pair every single source that I use, which is um, a source that's developed about or for or on behalf of disabled people with a source that is created either by a disabled person or a, a disabled led organization. The slogan, nothing about us without us, has been really central to disabled people's activism. And it's interesting, therefore, for us to try and write history that is um, ethically and practically guided by the same kind of principles. And very interesting, I think, to see what kind of history comes out when we, um, we deliberately choose to kind of narrow our, our way in by this, uh, this dueling process, this doubling process of pairing up sources. Three major genres of, um, of sources have made this possible for me. First of all, the memoirs and the autobiographies that were um, or have been and still are written by disabled people. Now, um, the slide here shows a number of covers of um, those kinds of publications, mostly from the post-war um, period. There's no go-to place to know where to find these, and I'm still very much in kind of receiving mode um, as I find more and more and people flag up to me more and more. I've identified about 50 so far. Some of these have come from the, the wonderful Burnett collection, which some of you may have, um, have used, which is uh, focused on, on working class autobiographies and, and it has um, hundreds of wonderful um, sources. But interestingly, that collection, which was indexed in 1985, which was a year that came after really substantial and high profile um, activism by disabled people, as well as the, um, the UN year um, uh, of disabled people in 1981. Even in that kind of context, disability is not in the index. So the scholars putting it together just didn't think that disability was a kind of a thing uh, that, that, that might be an interesting um, feature. Instead, if, if you want to find the, the, the writing by disabled people, it's there under the kind of much more Victorian heading of infirmity, um, which um, you know, spans a whole range of different kinds of sources, but there certainly is some very interesting writing on, um, on disability. So I'm working with a, a kind of corpus of life writings that um, date between, at the moment, 1931 and 2005. Those are the publication years. Um, they're evenly divided between men and women, roughly, which is interesting in its own right because lots of life writing is, is male-dominated. Um, it's writing that often um, stems from earlier in the life course than you might expect with non-disabled life writing. Um, and, and I think is interesting as well because it has a much wider range of, um, of, of social levels, if you like. There's people writing about their experiences who don't have any great cultural or social capital. They haven't been elected as an MP. They haven't um, got an MBE. You know, there's, there's, there's not necessarily um, that kind of social validation of their life story. Instead, being disabled and overcoming, if you like, disability, that's often the way in which they frame their story. That has um, uh, enabled a really wide range of vo voices in, in, in life writing terms. The second source that I'm using, a genre of sources, is, is oral histories. Um, there's a kind of rich collection of these at the British Library, which they call their Disability Voices um, collection. Although, interestingly, it's a pretty ad hoc collection. It's, it's almost a kind of opportunistic collection where they've put together a bunch of different um, oral history collections. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm using that, but also supplementing it with other collections around the country, where disability is often a kind of accidental rather than a deliberate theme of oral history taking. And finally, um, there's the sources that come from disability activists themselves, spanning the iconic trade union that was founded in 1893 as the National League of the Blind, or publications in the 1920s, such as the Cripples Journal, and the activities um, of the um, activist uh, um, disabled-led groups, such as the British Council of Organisations of Disabled People that was founded in 81. So there's a whole gamut there of um, uh, like a, a century and more of, of activism. Now, sometimes the status of sources that we use isn't clear. It's not clear whether um, they are about or by disabled people. Sometimes those categories are anachronistic. Uh, and I think um, uh, we have to accept that there's likely to be fuzziness there. Nonetheless, um, through this kind of dual 
um, methodology, I want to ask what the quota system was like for disabled people. Um, to set that quota into a bit of a larger landscape around policy making, but also around social change and economic change, deindustrialization, for example, and the, um, the status of the state as a, an intervener on social policy questions. And I, I think what we get from this is a story of, about how policy making was, if you like, done to disabled people, but also how they experienced it and how they contested it. So the first entry point that I want to, um, to give us is one which is definitely not a disabled-led um, organization. It's a study that was sponsored by the Medical Research Council in 1950, which came about six years after the quota had been um, uh, legislated in 1950. 1950 is a very interesting year because it's the peak year of registrations of disabled people on the quota register to cover nearly a million workers out of a, um, a working population of just under 24 million. It's, it's big, the quota is big, a million workers is, is a lot of people. So in a way, this MRC report gives us a chance of seeing the kind of disability settlement at, the, at its height of confidence. The study was directed by um, an epidemiologist called Tony Bradford Hill. Um, he had worked on the Industrial Fatigue Research Board in the 1920s. Um, and he'd also spent four years in hospital recovering from TB that he had uh, contracted during World War I. So he's kind of an interesting figure. There's no evidence that he identified as disabled, but he had um, experienced um, for himself what it was like to live um, for a very long period with, with, with bodily difference. The MRC survey went to um, all the different regions of the UK and it spoke to a sample of individuals who were on the disability register. Lots of the ones, uh, the people that, that were selected and were contacted, um, refused to be interviewed. They were very worried about what was going on in these interviews and whether their benefits would be taken away. Um, others were simply too rootless. They, they, they couldn't be found. They were registered, but you know, nobody had an address for them. They were living in lodgings houses. That in its own right gives us a sense of the, the kind of precarity uh, the economic precarity of lots of disabled people in 1950. The researchers produced pen portraits of disabled people accompanied by a kind of a, a scoring system that was intended to show their, um, their, their degree of personal adequacy. Overcoming disability is the kind of premise of, it's the logic, if you like, of the, the descriptions that we see. And overcoming disability is an interesting category because it, it always means just having a job. It's as simple as that. It's a very open and cut um, uh, uh, category. What does the MRC survey show us? Well, first of all, it shows that the designated sectors of lift operator and car park attendant employed less than 1% of all on the register. In other words, those reserved sectors did not meaningfully create employment. And really, we can see them as kind of a bit of, if you like, legislative or, um, or parliamentary window dressing. They were a concession, but not one that meaningfully changed the lives of disabled people. The survey also shows that despite so-called full employment conditions, there were really quite high levels of unemployment amongst disabled people. 36% of registered disabled men in the southeast of, of England were, were um, unemployed, 20% were unemployed in the more industrial northwest. So there's some interesting um, patterns there. The researchers also estimated that about 20% of people on the register shouldn't be on it. They were on it for trivial reasons. They, 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 they shouldn't really be seen as um, disabled. They were there perhaps because they had a stammer or because they had had a toe amputated. So you can see their sort of contestation about, about who gets to, um, to be legible to the state as disabled. Perhaps unwittingly, the survey showed some very interesting things on gender. Disabled women were actually not seen as important in quota terms. They were often dealt with in the reports of the MRC as an appendix. <laughs> they were literally put into the margins. Um, the quota was only about 5 to 8% female. And um, that was felt by the researchers to be because disabled women's work um, didn't have the same kind of physical demands or skill demands. Therefore, it was quite easy for disabled women to be absorbed. I mean, that was clearly based on the stereotypes that they had about skill and um, physical demands around uh, women's work. 
the Ministry of Labour was actually asked by employers in the 1950s um, whether if they didn't meet their 3% quota, they would be statutorily obliged to hire disabled men in jobs that were um, conventionally understood to be women's jobs. And the ministry, the civil servants at the ministry, um, uh, were, were a little bit like confused by the question, I think, but it, they decided after a while that their answer was that no, you didn't have to um, break the kind of conventional bound, uh, boundaries of gender in the labour market in order to um, meet your statutory requirements. In other words, gender trumped disability as a, um, a kind of uh, a, a form of labour market organisation. But contrary to that, in households with disabled members, you, you get actually a surprising degree of willingness to trade what were conventional gender roles. So, um, there's a, a quote on the slide here that I'll read a bit out of, showing a description um, of um, the life of a Scottish disabled ex-soldier, where the researcher noted his wife goes out working, they live in a dark, dingy basement where he does all the cooking and housework and looks after the children. So the surveys do definitely show that disabled men were willing to take on care work and be supported by female relatives. In Blackpool, um, for example, disabled men were, quote, content to help in the boarding house in summer and act as an employee of their wives and sign on at the labour exchange through the winter months. So disability led, um, for, um, led to flexibility in the usually very heavily uh, gender segregated um, uh, experiences of labour in mid-century Britain. Also worthy of note in the MRC survey, and I promise you I'd, I'd, that, that there'd be a kind of some sense of the kind of the, the dueling needed to fight against um, the ableist logics here. Um, you get a kind of extraordinarily stigmatized language describing disabled people who um, researchers uh, are blaming disabled people for their so-called antisocial or sociopathic qualities. Writing, quote, the men are discharged because they are poor workmen poor timekeepers, grumblers, or disturbers of the peace. They appear to live isolated lives in constant discord. They accept public money as a right due to them. So, I mean, I, I think what you see in the study is that disabled people have a kind of script that they're expected to follow, which is of gratefulness and stoicism. Uh, and those who didn't follow that script were, were very definitely cast as kind of spivs or as rascals. The languages that you get are languages that I think are rooted in um, Victorian investigations of sort of um, shiftlessness amongst um, the poor. And, and there's a kind of, there's a really strong degree of suppressed violence in lots of the descriptions. And, and this seems likely to me to be based on the fact that even though by 1950 there's a new welfare order, lots of the interviewers um, and researchers were people who had had experience of earlier sort of more punitive welfare structures of the poor law or of um, voluntary sector approaches to disability. The 1944 Act therefore was only kind of quite superficially a turning point in a, you could say, a kind of larger palimpsest of welfare infrastructure. And it's a reminder, um, as of all bureaucratic systems, that welfare systems have what you could call a kind of a temporal drag whereby old structures remain and efforts to reform them or, or change direction are very piecemeal um, and don't necessarily uh, deliver anything. Researchers concluded overall that the quota system was an economic success. It was credible in terms of, um, of fairness. It was an acceptable moral economy, if you like. But they kept very focused on the individual, concluding, quote, the determining factor in the resettlement of any disabled person is his personality and his attitude to work. Now let's put that survey alongside um, uh, some very different sources from the 1950s. First of all, I want to talk about an oral history. Alan Council is an individual who was born in 1937 in Blackburn. He had a, um, a, a speech impediment and quite limited mobility. He, he went to a mainstream school and at age 15, um, like all the others in his school, two years after the MRC survey, he was seen by a careers advisor at his secondary modern school who told him that he could never work 
He then went to see a doctor and the doctor confirmed that medically he could not work. And that meant that he couldn't be registered under the quota system because you had to be capable of, of working uh, to join the register. Alan was um, quite depressed, understandably, at this prospect. And I'll, I'll read you out some of his quote. He says, I became really obstinate. I refused to get out of bed. I refused to feed myself and I was in a right mess. My mum, she must have been very brave. She knew a fellow from her past who was some kind of boss in a cotton mill. She went to visit this man. She hadn't seen him for 20 odd years, but she went to find him and he gave me a job. I got this job as a warehouse boy in a cotton mill, but not because of the career officer, because of my mum. So that kind of spurred me on and I resumed eating and walking and all that. Now we know quite a lot about Alan's job because um, uh, he uh, was, took part in a 2005 oral history um, uh, a part of a collection of people who had experienced cerebral palsy. Um, but interestingly, he also wrote a memoir about his, um, his work in the cotton mill and, and then he went on to work in nursing and in teaching. Um, the memoir was published um, in 1982 and like um, lots that were published really across the second half of the 20th century, it was blurbed as a, li a life of extraordinary determination and courage an amazing and inspirational success story. I think that reviews of, of disabled people's writing all too often use that kind of framing that, that we might today describe as a kind of super crip um, uh, genre, a very confining genre that's only willing to see disabled people in these kind of singular um, heroic terms, whatever actual stories they may in fact be telling. Now, Alan's memoir came into being uh, in circumstances that I think are very interesting, he had written a very full cover letter when he had applied for a job as a deputy head teacher. And his wife was kind of so, so impressed by this long letter he had written that she suggested that he get it published and that was the basis of his memoir. So it's, it's interesting that applying for job might kind of in, elicit life writing or, or, or mandate uh, life writing. Alan continued to be very frustrated by the disability infrastructure, the, 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 the infrastructure of the 1944 Act. That medical judgment that he was unemployable stayed on his file and meant that even after seven years of successful working in a, in a, um, a cotton mill, the local labour exchange refused to work with him when he wanted to change jobs in 1959. The DRO, who was the, the kind of the, the disability advisor, um, eventually was persuaded to send him away for um, labour capacity assessment and he was determined to be suited to gardening, a role that he really didn't want to do and he also pointed out um, there, were, there were no jobs in gardening um, in his local community. But any individual protest was held to be a black mark so it wasn't possible for him to, to opt out of the, the gardening niche that he was placed in. Uh, and, th and this is a kind of reminder of the, the, the expectation of passive cooperation that was very much projected onto disabled people. And in fact, it was Alan's own initiative in answering newspaper ads that got him um, further and in fact more professional work. Now that experience he had of being excluded from the quota uh, was apparently shared by many because in those um, oral histories of people with cerebral palsy that are held at the British Library, um, of all the the, the interviews they had, 76 interviews, only one other mentioned the quota. Barry Morgan, who was born in 1945 in Walsall, described in his 2005 interview his experience, quote, when I left school, I went to the labour exchange as it was then, and I went to see a disablement bloke. It was the law that companies had to employ so many disabled people. This was about the end of the 50s. I remember our dad took me down to the labour exchange we went and seen this woman and her found me a job. So I went to the firm and it was in the warehouse. Interesting that both of them started out working in, in warehouses. And in both cases, the parents are a very strong mediator of their, uh, their finding work. Now, apart from Barry's kind of quite brief mention there that, that, that I've given you, every other interview did not mention um, anything about any of the statutory disability provision. And indeed, every other interview held by the British Library with a disabled person also does not mention it. And Alan and Barry's um, testimony are, are much more representative in focusing on the kind of very local and very familial experiences of labour. Both Alan and Barry were very ambitious and they um, recorded their sense of their worth as workers 
Barry wrote about his choices as he kind of went on in the labour market. He wrote as he changed jobs, this was my decision, this was me. It was nothing to do with my mum and dad. Of course, the money had a lot to do with it. I was on a tenner and a tanner at Hawley's, but I got £4.10 down at Tilsley's. He was a very acute observer of, 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 of value in the labour market and how he could navigate that. He also stressed how significant work was for him because he enjoyed it, he liked the skill. And he also liked the kind of gendered social status that work gave him. He said, socially, when I was out socially, I could say, well, I've been working on a Ford Zephyr today, you know, and it was interesting. So he's, he, he, he enjoyed the fact that that gave him a sort of entry into male homosocial discussions about cars. So both Alan and Barry had quite successful working lives and they described upward mobility. Both of them ended up as lecturers in one way or another. But they both also reported quite deep costs. Alan was dependent on alcohol in his first mill job because he was very nervous about his speech impediment and, and worried about speaking in public. He later had to leave a job in nursing when he became a whistleblower over the treatment of intellectually disabled um, hospital residents of whom he recalled, I kept thinking, this could be me, you know, this could be me. Barry had to give up his work in engineering after he was, he was attacked at, at a bus stop targeted because of his uh, disability. And that had a very deep psychological impact. He said, it made me very wary of sort of people and things like that. In fact, it prevented me from going very far away from home. A psychiatrist prescribed him tranquilizers, and he was retired on medical grounds, despite being only 37 years old. So that was a very difficult period of isolation and, and kind of self-doubt for Barry. I'm going, to, I'm going to put them on one side now, Alan and Barry, although I'll come back to them. But I give um, a bit of detail there about their working lives to show how very faint the traces are of that 1944 um, infrastructure of quota, DRO, reserved occupations, and so on. Blind and visually impaired people in their kind of parallel structures, found employment particularly difficult and unfulfilling because the 1920 legislation had called for them to be, quote, encouraged to take up employment for which eyesight is wholly or nearly inessential. That's a direct uh, quote from the Act. And that gave a rationale for limiting their employment to a certain number of areas that had become associated with blind people's labour. In particular, uh, map making, which is shown on the slide here in a very sort of crowded workshop, uh, a workshop for the blind, as it was called, in Cardiff. Um, but also uh, jobs such as brush making, telephony, massage and piano tuning. You wouldn't really guess the frustrations and the limits that we can see in, certainly in Alan and Barry's um, testimony, from the kind of relentlessly upbeat um, promotional narrative that emerges both from the state and from the voluntary sector. That narrative about progress and inclusion was in fact to break down under the changing economic profile of the UK as between 1960 and 1990, there was a mass shift away from manufacturing and industrial jobs, the very jobs on which provision for disabled people had relied. Unemployment rose over that period and that disproportionately affected disabled people. So, I mean, we definitely um, can and should tell a sort of anti-Whiggish story here of opportunities for employment uh, and inclusion that, that closed up really as the British economy changed. At the same time, there's another kind of landscape of change, which is the rise of mass education and forms of occupational mobility, the, 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 the growth of managerial jobs and white collar jobs. And we can, we, we've witnessed that really in the lives of Alan and Barry. Map making, pictured here on the slide, began to, to seem very confining, particularly in Cardiff, where public officials were embarrassed to learn that Cardiff prison had adopted the trade of map making. And because they didn't pay their prisoners very much, they were undercutting the blind workers and getting um, uh, mostly government contracts to supply mats. That association between prison labor and sheltered workshops was not lost on blind campaigners. In 1972, campaigner Fred Reed, um, he was uh, a, a, the president of the disabled-led organization, the National Federation of the Blind. And he's pictured here on the slide, standing with his, um, his wife and his 
three children and their two um, uh, guide dogs. Fred Reed made a very vocal attack on that statutory requirement to put people in, um, blind and visually impaired people in jobs uh, for which their blindness suited them. Um, and instead he outlined a kind of new and increasingly dominant approach, which was to, um, to adopt a rights-based approach to assume that all labor could be made um, potentially um, accessible to, to disabled people if you, if you gave them the right accommodations. And, and that's interesting. Fred Reed's um, intervention in 1972 is actually the first moment that I've been able to find in the archive that um, anti-discrimination became the core demand uh, of um, the approach to the employment of disabled people. Alongside support for disabled people to found their own businesses, that was the second um, demand that Fred Reed highlighted. Now, Fred Reed is interesting because his own employment, he was, a, he was a history lecturer at Warwick University, kind of illustrates the much wider aspirations and achievements that, that uh, are found amongst disabled people. The National Federation of the Blind suggested that disabled people should be put in charge of enforcement of, um, of the quota instead of allowing employers to judge who was suitable um, as a viable worker. Now, interestingly, at this moment in, in, the, in the kind of mid-70s, that anti-discrimination approach, that rights-based approach, didn't um, rule out the quota. So the National Federation for the Blind called for the quota to be increased to 5% and more strictly enforced. That question of enforcement, in a way, was the, the, the kind of the, the most crucial weak spot. It had always been the case that the quota was not uh, enforced. No employers were ever fined for not reaching their quota. And in the 70s, when the Manpower Services Commission took over um, uh, like administering the quota, even they did not meet their quota of employing disabled people. The numbers on the register had fallen, despite the working population growing substantially, the numbers on the register had fallen from about a million in 1950 to about half a million uh, by the mid-70s. Disabled people simply didn't have a reason to register, and lots of them thought that it would actually stigmatize them and, and, and harm them in the labor market. What we see then is, is a, um, a, a history of politicization of the idea of the quota in ways it hadn't previously been. The uh, political right began to portray it as a excessive form of bureaucracy, a kind of market distortion, a burden on businesses. And they proposed instead just voluntaristic measures like a kind of code of good practice. This is how you, you, you should treat your disabled employees. The political left kind of rolled up the quota in a wider anti-discrimination agenda uh, that, that spanned grounds of sex and race. Um, even though, interestingly, the quota itself didn't make any claims about non-discrimination. It wasn't, it wasn't premised on the idea of, of anti-discrimination. Now, that new approach from the left can be illustrated by a very interesting moment in the, in the mid-80s. This, if you like, is the kind of, I think of it as the last gasp of the quota. Um, and it's a, a, an episode that happened in the London borough of Lambeth, who employed about 10,000 people. And in um, 1986, they decided to halt all recruitment until they had met their quota of disabled people. So um, the slide shows some publicity, which is explaining that only disabled people can apply for jobs in Lambeth. And that remained in place for about uh, five months, during which period the, the um, percentage of disabled um, employees at Lambeth went from about 1% to about three and a half percent. So they, they met and exceeded their quota. Line managers were quite skeptical, it has to be said. Some teams stopped recruiting altogether in that period of the enforcement of the quota. And um, it was quite difficult to appoint at the senior level. A lot of the people, the disabled people who were appointed were men who were appointed into kind of manual grades. Lambeth Council, um, uh, undertook this as part of a kind of wider program of inclusive employment um, policies. All middle and senior management vacancies had to shortlist, for example, at least one woman and one black person. And the slide shows again a bit of uh, Lambeth publicity, which outlines their commitment to anti-discrimination on eight different grounds of protected characteristic. Now, their disability initiative in 1986 really cemented their reputation as 
um, uh, what was termed in the right-wing press politically balmy or crackpot. And in a way, I think that kind of national news um, uh, profile was sort of what was wanted by the council. Um, it was initiated very much by sort of top-down uh, council leaders as a way to embarrass other councils and also the conservative-led um, government. Equal opportunities policies in the 80s became a kind of political uh, choreography or a, a culture war, if you like. Um, although we, we do need to acknowledge that for about 300 disabled people in Lambeth, it did get them a job. So it did do something. Interestingly, however, local disabled people who did benefit from this, this policy were not consulted and Lambeth acknowledged that they did not take the quota seriously. They did not welcome this intervention. So for me, this, this kind of source, for all that it seems to be um, benefiting disabled people, isn't a source that we can say is sort of, un, you know, under the, um, under the, the control of disabled people. This is, a, this is a, a, an event that is um, for and about disabled people rather than authored by them. Lambeth believed that they had challenged the status of disability as what they called a poor relation in uh, equal opportunities practice, but no other councils followed suit. And a year later, a government um, consultation in 1987 proposed a different approach, which was to keep the quota, but to get rid of the register. And that, in effect, was a kind of sleight of hand that would make the quota completely unenforceable, because if there's no way of determining who is disabled, there's no way of determining um, who, who would fulfill your, your quota employment. Now, the responses to this are a very interesting little snapshot of, of kind of opinion on disability issues. Lots of large companies, perhaps unsurprisingly, were happy to go along with volunteerism. The British Institute of Management declared in their response, really echoing the kind of Thatcherite response, that they were unconvinced that problems involving the employment of disabled people can be solved by legislation. We also have interesting responses from non-disabled-led organisations who were often quite kind of complacently in agreement with the consultation. So, for example, um, I, and I don't mean to, to like single them out, but this is just an example of the kind of rhetoric. The Association for All Speech Impaired Children, which was a charity that um, had the Duchess of Gloucester as its patron, said in response, we applaud all that you are doing and in essence agree with everything that you say. A classic uh, response, I think, from the voluntary sector. But we do see in 87 disabled-led organisations adopting a very different language. And this is very um, visible in the response of um, SCOPE, who were then called the Spastic Society. And SCOPE were very harshly critical of the consultation, noting that the social model of disability wasn't reflected in the government's actions. And, and again, this is a very interesting moment where you kind of see the, the footprint, if you like, of the social model um, starting to appear in archival sources. So they wrote, the consultation assumes that the disability causes the disadvantage rather than society causing the disadvantage by not adapting to the disability, a very pithy statement of the social model. They rejected talk of um, national responsibility uh, or obligation and instead they said the society believes that the appropriate philosophical basis is to be found by using the conceptual framework of equality of opportunity, human rights and discrimination. So, I mean, that, that nicely, you know, captures that, that discourse of the 80s, which is starting to reach for very different tools. Um, and that was to help build much more assertive campaigning by disabled people that was eventually to lead to the uh, 1995 Disability Discrimination Act, which, which got rid of the, um, the quota. And you can see some of that kind of um, active um, uh, campaigning in the, in the actions of the... Um, the direct action network um, and the slide here shows some some pictures of them boy, um, uh, um, uh, um, set, setting up uh, protests over the lack of accessibility of buses these are very iconic protests from the late 80s and early 90s that seems like a moment of change we could sort of you know have a, 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 a teleological story, if you like, of um, achievement of having um, managed to get a discrimination um, measure on the statute books in 1995. And we're, we're about to see the 30th anniversary of the legislation, and I'm sure it will be celebrated in that way. But I think we might go back again to the micro scale of the lives of Alan and Barry to really assess, as historians 
what difference it made. Barry's oral history explicitly noted um, how little the Disability Discrimination Act, the DDA, impacted him. And instead, he, he really framed his working life around his own initiative, his own enterprise, his getting his foot in at any door. So after he had been unwillingly retired at age 37, he went on to achieve a self-employed role. He was repairing the kind of coin-operated rides that I'm sure um, some of you know that kind of are often in British supermarkets. Um, and then he ended up acquiring his own coin-operated rides and, and built up quite a big business that was employing lots of other people uh, running and maintaining those, those rides. Alan Council was similarly entrepreneurial. So he spent a, a kind of, a, a lot of his working life was in teaching. But um, in the 80s, he claimed an enterprise allowance. And despite the explicit objections of the DRO, who told him he was being unrealistic, um, he became a se successful self-employed trainer in disability issues. So both of these men uh, benefited from self-employment and they embraced ideas of enterprise in a way that's quite commonly linked in our minds to kind of Thatcherite marketization. What should our conclusions be? I'm going to try and like step back out now into the kind of meta-narrative. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's obvious that we need to be um, a bit wary of Whiggish tendencies to celebrate the DDA. Like lots of other major turning points in British history, it's kind of a glass half full rather than a, um, a very significant moments of change. It did give a right to pr procedural justice, but it didn't give any means of actually compelling that justice. There was no... Um, uh, enforcement body. The Disability Rights Commission wasn't established until 2000. Uh, Lord Leicester, who was um, a member of the House of Lords at the time, called the DDA vague, slippery and elusive. In larger terms, that kind of emphasis on anti-discrimination and rights, which sort of resonates very, um, very nicely with, with our, our assumptions today, it's quite hard to actually fit into our sort of larger meta-narratives of British history. Particularly, I would say, the dominant meta-narrative of our field, which is, um, has been really for the past sort of five or eight years, the idea of social democracy being challenged and then supplanted by marketization, by ne neoliberalism, by the new right. I think that the reason why the quota was abandoned in 1995 was actually for very kind of contingent and specific uh, politicization reasons. It had become a kind of bipartisan, sorry, it had uh, th that kind of bipartisan commitment to disability and inclusion had ended and it had been newly identified in the 80s as a kind of loony left um, or leftist intervention. So conservative politicians of the 80s definitely preferred more individualistic uh, approaches, approaches that seemed to deliver more possibilities of choice an agency for disabled people. And that does chime with the lives of Ellen and Barry, who embraced the idea of founding their own businesses. But if we too neatly kind of wrap up the quota and its end in um, this narrative around choice, enterprise, or neoliberalism, I think we lose some very important perspectives. So um, I'll end with a few thoughts about what we, what we, what we lose. Uh, first of all, we, we clearly don't see very, 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 very visibly the influence of Europe European policymaking, I've, I've said, was very important in the, in the 40s and the 30s when um, uh, they were thinking up you know, ways of, of, of approaching disability. Um, and in, in, in the 80s and the 90s, that is also true. So the European Council had drafted a uh, recommendation on the employment of disabled people um, in 1986, the same year that the Lambeth experiment was happening, which was framed around rights and non-discrimination. So that is very much um, behind some of the new emphases. We also get in Europe examples of um, quotas that, that persist, quotas that were not ditched as apparently sort of not, not compatible with rights, but quotas that successfully were combined with rights, which are still operating today in France, in Germany, in Spain. And I think we need to keep bear in mind that that could easily have been possible in, in the UK. We could easily still have a quota system today. There's quite specific contingent reasons why we do not. I think that the narrative about neoliberalism also runs the risk of too closely um, tying together ideas of enterprise and entrepreneurialism with the political new right. In fact, self-employment and business formation 
was a very important means of countering discrimination for disabled people, as it was also for racially minoritized people. So just as historians have quite usefully invited us to think about individualism in non-Thatcherite ways, I think we might want to do the same thing with ideas of enterprise, which had a wider social throw. And you can kind of see this in some of my sources. So Barry Morgan's interview, when he was asked about his best memory, he says, the best memory that I have is achieving the ability of being independent by being self-employed, putting my two fingers up at society in general. Uh, I've also included um, on the slide a, a picture of Micheline Mason, who was a really prominent and quite radical um, uh, disability activist who founded the Liberation Network of Disabled People in 1980. But perhaps um, against our expectations, she also produced a book in 1978, which was um, called Creating Your Own Work and was all about um, small business formation as a way of um, countering isolation and exclusion for disabled people. And in just a hint of the kind of longer history of this, I note too that in the 1950s, a disabled-led organization called the Coventry Cripples Club renamed itself the Enterprise Club for Disabled People. And the slide shows a bit of their, um, their publicity celebrating this idea of, of enterprise. So I think there is a much broader story that we could tell about enterprise, which isn't necessarily a story about neoliberalism. I think that um, the focus on the quota and the story that we might tell of it um, gives us a story that is quite likely to be dominated by the experiences of white men. And, you know, deliberately, I've um, worked with sources, the, the oral histories and memoirs that come from two white men. Um, and that's because all aspects of the quota imagined and favoured male participation. And the archives that we associate with quota um, employment are really focused on white experiences and you, you start to see that in the 80s when you, you start to get um, black and Asian led um, uh, disabled people's organizations um, who, who really identify the ways in which um, uh, racial exclusion is sits very much alongside and in partnership with um, forms of ableism and as recent historians have argued social democracy can be seen as a kind of project of whiteness Women and people of colour really just haven't featured much in today's talk, but I'm very happy to talk about them in, uh, in the Q&A. There's, there's very interesting stories to tell there. And then just finally, we've talked a lot today about um, statutory experiences, and I want to point out that in, in focusing on turning points like the quota or the, the Disability Discrimination Act in 1995, we may really overstate the extent of change in disabled people's lives. The quota, which was you know, enacted but not enforced, actually changed almost nothing in the lives of um, most disabled people. Barry Morgan um, was asked to reflect on change in his interview. And he said, in relation to attitudes to disabled people over his lifetime, what had changed? Simply very little. And we need to always be attentive to those stories and voices that tell us about the absence of change. Thank you all.